All right, welcome everyone to TRAF on 101. We are going to be doing a number of presentations through this season to get any new athletes um, or athletes who are new to the sport or athletes who just want a refresher up on everything they need to know about the sport. And the first one we're going to go over is equipment because uh, that's an important thing. Everyone's still trying to get their equipment together. Um, and this is uh, something important that you need to get thinking about right from the get-go. And we've had lots of questions about this kind of thing. The equipment that we're going to be going over, of course, we're going to talk about swimming equipment, cycling equipment, running equipment, and we're also going to touch on race-specific equipment that you, that you may need. Okay, so let's start with the swim equipment. Now, all athletes, especially um, when we cannot use the facilities equipment, must have goggles. That's a must. Swim cap, swimsuit, kickboard, pull boy, and fins. Goggles, of course, is going to be important. Swim caps um, are going to be very important. Every year, it seems like we have a number of athletes that do not have swim caps. And what happens if you have any bit of hair that could get into uh, your eyes or your face or your mouth, um, if you don't have a swim cap, it's going to get there. And it's really going to get irritating for the swimmer. And they're not going to be able to focus on the drills or the freestyle uh, stroke. And they're not going to get better at the stroke. So we want to make sure that they have that hair out of the way. It's not necessarily about racing. <laughs> Swim caps, usually people think, oh, well, it's, it's all about being streamlined and, and slicker in the water, and it's not. It's about keeping the hair um, out of the eyes and the nose and the mouth and the face so that you can focus on swimming. Uh, swimsuits, we'll talk about that in a moment. Kickboards, pull boys, fins, all really good. Competitive athletes, however, should also have a snorkel and paddles. They're going to be using that a fair bit. So that's the junior the senior and the elite. Now, if you're in the Calgary area, best places to get swim equipment, number one would be Team Aquatics. You can order um, online from them. You can also go to their store that they have here at Calgary. Um, and our club, we have a shark card, which you can use for a discount. I believe it's 15%. And if you need access to that card, let me know. I did email those out earlier in the season and they are available on the website. You can also look at Mac. They have a little bit of some stuff at Amazon, of course. You know what you're looking for. Swimsuits. Now we got a group of swimmers here. These are not chronos, but uh, this, they've got a good array of swimsuits here. So girls should be wearing a one piece. That's preferable. And the boys should be wearing either briefs or jammers. So if you look at the boys here, um, oh, let's go with a better color than that. Let's go with the dark blue. So we've got some briefs right here. So those are typically what people will call speedos. And then you've also got jammers right here, which are tight and go just above the knee. So you want to avoid things like bikinis and board shorts. If that's all you have right now, don't skip practice because all you have is a bikini or a or board shorts, we want you to come uh, in any swim kit that you have, but this is going to be preferable. So make sure that you go out and get those. Okay. Um, board shorts, especially for the boys, that's really going to slow you down. And there's a lot of drag with board shorts, and you're going to have trouble keeping up with the other athlete. Kickboards, there's many different styles and sizes and shapes and colors and all kinds of stuff, right? Most kickboards are going to be fine. So here's a, a variety of probably the most common kickboards you'll see out there, um, especially that our athletes have. Any of these will be fine. Pull boys, we do a lot of balance work and body position work with pull boys. Your athletes are going to need one. There's, again, lots of different styles and and um, these three on the side are all acceptable. The main thing is that you want to make sure there's something that has you kind of have these dimples here where you can hold on to that pull boy between either the ankles, do some drills pull, uh, with the pull boy between the ankles, and others more commonly between the thighs. So just make sure you can, can hold it there. Fins, now this is a big one. Al, all athletes are going to need to bring their own fins. 
especially those younger athletes. This is going to be more important for those youth development athletes and anyone new to swimming. Uh, because the purpose of fins in our program is that they help with swim drills. Um, and if you've tried to do swim drills and you're new to swimming and you haven't used fins before, you'll notice that you can't really focus very well on the drills. And so we want athletes to have proper fins that they can use to help them become better swimmers. Uh, it's going to get really frustrating if your athlete does not have fins. And we still have a few athletes that don't have fins. And they get frustrated because they can't keep up with the drills and the drills aren't doing them any good because they're not doing them properly because they don't have the propulsion to do it properly yet. There are some fins that are acceptable. All these ones here on the left look really good. You'll notice that they have shorter fins. They're not super long. Um, and this allows you to keep a pretty good kicking rate as you swim. Avoid things like these over here. Um, the scuba, scuba fins. I think we, I've seen a, a few, a couple of these around. Um, we don't want to use these because they've got really long fins. They're not made for swimming. They're made for scuba diving and snorkeling. And you can't keep a high kick rate with those fins. And so it doesn't mimic swimming freestyle as well as those ones on the left. So make sure that you have something that fits and something that's appropriate to swimming. Wetsuit, this is something you don't have to worry about immediately. However, in the spring and summer, you might need to. Our competitive athletes are the ones that are probably going to have to worry about them more so uh, because they'll be swimming open water mostly. Younger athletes, not as much. However, you need to look at a triathlon specific wetsuit if you're looking at wetsuits. Now, swimming freestyle in the open water, freestyle requires a lot of mobility and movement through the shoulders. Most wetsuits out there for other sports are not going to allow for that mobility through the shoulders. However, tri triathlon uh, wetsuits primarily they're made of neoprene, are going to, right here, the shoulders and the arms, they're going to be thinner material. The material thins out a little bit there so that you have more mobility through the arms. So they're specific to swimming in the water, and they're specific to triathlon and open water swimming. So you're going to want to look for something like that. There's a number of, of good um, brands that you, can, that you can look at, Xterra, Hub, um, Blue 70, uh, um, Zoo, there's a number of, of good brands out there. Um, for the younger athletes who are a li little bit smaller, we do have, I think, five, six, maybe seven wetsuits that we will be using. So I would suggest that it mostly be the juniors, um, the seniors, and the elites that are focusing on getting tri suits. Any of those younger Devo athletes. We have tri suits they can try on, and you're probably not going to be doing too many open water swimming anyway. Wetsuits um, are permitted for any races where the water temperature is 20 and below. Um, so there is the possibility that in the summer, if it's a really warm area, you might not even be allowed to wear a wetsuit when you're swimming. Uh, or during a race, but it, they're heavy to have. Usually we have a few races, especially at the beginning of the year anyway, where you're gonna, gonna need them. Cycling gear, let's move on to this. So of course, bikes, trainers, indoor clothing that you wanna use, outdoor clothing, shoes, helmets, and then uh, of course the Zwift setup. And we'll go through one of these. Best places if you're in Calgary to get cycling equipment. Mech has a lot of cycling equipment. They're a fantastic resource. They're usually where I will go to get my cycling gear. Amazon, of course, you can find anything on there. And if you've got a local bike shop near your community or near your neighborhood, definitely pop in there. They'll have a lot of stuff. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of them focus on mountain bike equipment, but, but uh, there are a few out there that uh, focus a little bit on road cycling equipment and, and track on specific, they'll be able to help you out. Okay, bikes. Uh, the big one here. Obviously, you can't cycle without a bike. Um, 
Now, road bikes are required for draft legal events. So you'll notice here on the left-hand side, we've got three different bikes. This right here is our road bike. Okay, you'll notice they've got much thinner tires for going on the road. We've got drops, which means the handlebars drop down. And these are what are used for draft legal events. This is what we require all of our athletes to have because we focus on short course draft legal racing. In the springtime um, and the summer, when we move outside uh, for the cycling, even if you've got one of the younger athletes, like one of the youth development, uh, and they're not doing draft legal, uh, youth are perfectly fine to race on something like this, a mountain bike or, or a commuter bike, or, or really on any kind of bike, um, mostly. Um, and that's fine for young athletes that are getting into the sport. However, in our club, we want to make sure all the athletes have road bikes. That's why we have the Future Champions program to make sure that we're reducing uh, the barrier to entry and making sure everyone has the proper equipment to be able to do that. Um, we're going to want those because as we go outside and we ride in a group, it's safer to be riding in that group all on road bikes and that way nobody's going to get left behind. You'll notice that mountain bike on there, big thick tires, mountain bikes, commuter bikes there, they can be a little slower than a road bike. And so we want to keep everyone together and safe. Bottom left-hand corner, you're going to see this thing right here, a TT bike. Sometimes you'll hear them called or a, or a tri bike sometimes. Uh, TT stands for time trial. And so those were, eventually, uh, were originally made for time trialing, solo riding. So in draft legal, we do not use those. Those are not permitted in draft legal racing and we do not focus those um in our on those in our club so you'll notice they have an arrow bar right here oh, uh, you got the arrow bar there that you sit on uh, rest your elbows up over here put your arms on there and it just gets you in a nice i'll drop a little stick down here <laughs> gets you into a nice arrow position right okay so you can go super super fast However, this isn't safe for drafting because you're in a position that you can't maneuver very easily. Uh, it's very difficult, um, especially for younger riders to be able to maneuver a bike like this. And the brakes besides that are down here. So you're not anywhere near the brakes and riding in a group, you want quick access to the brakes. So I will say, if you are a youth athlete, don't even have your sights set on one of these TT bikes yet. I've heard young athletes talk about how they can't wait to have a TT bike. You don't need one. And you don't want to do that kind of racing for, for a long time. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Brakes. So there are a lot of different types of brakes. Uh, and this is important because you used to not be able to use some kinds of brakes in draft legal racing. Uh, but you can, you can now, okay? So up here at the top, uh, top left, right up here, we have a uh, caliper brake. Um, you'll also see sometimes cantilever brakes or V-brakes. These are acceptable and they always have been. Here in the bottom right, you've got disc brake. Those used to not be permitted, but they are now. So that has something that has changed. So it always used to be that triathletes had to and had to worry about racing and make sure they didn't have a bike with disc brakes. That is not the case anymore. Both of these options are permitted. You'll notice the difference is that with this disc brake down here, you'll see that it's got this rotor, uh, this disc, literally a disc, and that is the brake. Right here, we've got the brake itself. And when you uh, when you pull on the brake uh, lever, it's going to pinch and create friction on that disc, which is, is going to actually break and slow down the bike. Now, with the caliper brakes up on the top left or the cantilever and V brakes work similarly, when you press on the brake lever, it's going to close those calipers and the brake pads are going to push and pinch against the inside of the wheel. So that's the difference is that the friction is directly on the, on the wheel there. 
still effective braking. Disc brakes, you're going to have a little bit more braking power, and so you need to be a lot more control of your bike and comfortable with that. Um, but both are acceptable currently in draft legal. Trainers. So this is something I've been discussing with a lot of you lately. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of trainers. And right now, you should be focusing on finding a trainer if you are doing either of these two things. You're doing OIO at home sessions, so the on your own sessions from Training Peaks. If you're doing those at home, you'll need a trainer during the winter months because you don't want to go outside on your road bike when there's a couple feet of snow or, or any snow or, uh, or there's ice on the pathways or the roadways. Or if you're going to do the virtual Saturday sessions, which is our juniors, our seniors, and our elites, you'll need a trainer for that as well. Now, there is everything from simple trainers and you do not need anything complex. Don't think that you need anything special. If you've got the very most basic trainer and you can set up your bike on it, that is perfectly fine. So this one here at the top left, uh, this is a very simple trainer. Um, you set up your, your, your bike um, here on the trainer. You'll see that they kind of have these uh, two spots right here that, that uh, clasp, oh, I'm trying to show you, clasp over the, uh, or onto the wheel, onto the hub. And then this roller down here is where the wheel set sits on. And then you move and spin your bike. Your bike stays in place. And uh, and you can spin inside continuously. Um, there's also smart trainers, and I would say uh, you don't need to worry so much about a smart trainer unless you're doing a lot more training and you're more serious about triathlon. So I would say all of our elite athletes should be focusing on trying to find a smart trainer if they're able to. They are a bit more expensive, um, but they will be more beneficial. Smart trainer generally. Um, is going to give you, or not generally, it will give you your power output and the speed that you're riding at. So it's a, essentially a computer built into the trainer and gives you a bunch of information, okay? Um, and it will send that information to either your bike computer or your computer or to Zwift or to whatever uh, cycling application you're using. Um, and it's super handy to have. Also here, I kind of included a picture of another trainer. I don't know that any, very many of our athletes have any of these, but this is a wheel off trainer. So you'll notice he doesn't actually have the, the wheel sitting there. He's taking the wheel off and then the frame of the bike goes directly onto the trainer. So this is handy in that you're not gonna wear out uh, the, the tire that you have on your bike. So with the tire in trainers, these ones here at the top, at the end of the winter, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you go get a new tire or that you use a trainer tire, um, which is a bit more durable and it's specifically used to, uh, for our trainers. Um, we also have rollers and I'm gonna explain that on the next slide here. I will also point out, so I'm gonna go back here. Um, oh, it's not letting me go back. Um, I'll also point out that if you have one of the 24 inch bikes are really, really small bikes from the future champions program, you do have the ability to get a trainer from us that has a adapter that will allow it to fit the smaller wheel size that you have. Um, and you'll generally, if you got one of those smaller bikes, you're going to need an adapter on whatever trainer that you have. Sometimes those could be tricky. To find. So if you have questions about that, let me know. Rollers. Uh, so you may have seen something like this before. So trainers, you actually hook your bike into, and then you don't have to worry so much about your balance. The great thing about rollers, and I'm not going to tell you to go out and get rollers, um, but if you have a set of rollers lying around, they're super good uh, to get used to and to utilize. Rollers, you don't actually hook your bike onto it. Your bike sits on top of these rollers and you'll notice his rear wheel is sitting on top of the back two rollers and the front is on the front. And as you pedal and as you move, those rollers move and you've got to keep yourself balanced 
on those rollers while you ride. And so it's a bit more similar to riding outdoors. Really helps with, uh, with um, bike skills and those kinds of things. Now, if you want, I did put a link up on here to show what rollers look like. You can also just search on Google or YouTube rollers, cycling rollers, and lots of videos will come up. They won't let me play that video here while recording this presentation, but you can uh, go take a look at that. Okay, trainer skewers. You're going to need a trainer skewer if you're using an indoor trainer. The trainer skewer goes through the hub of the rear wheel, um, well, technically both wheels, but rear wheel, um, and allows you to place your bike into the trainer. Now, you notice the top left here, well, let's look at the bottom right. These are the trainer skewers, and you'll see that their ends are quite nubby, all right? They're, they're shaped specifically so that they will fit inside the trainer itself. These ones right here, these are used for outdoor riding when you're not on the trainer. There's no nub, you wouldn't be able to fit this into your trainer. So you wanna look for something like the bottom right. You can find those super cheap, uh, Mac, online on Amazon, um, uh, any bike shop, um, you can find those. If you're having trouble finding those, come to, to Coach Lisa or I, but you do need those. Um, cycling clothing. So at the beginning of the season, when we have our cycling practices, usually those new that have never done cycling show up in, in uh, uh, shorts or even pants um, and just not the right cycling gear. Cycling gear is going to be really important, um, not because we want you to look like a hardcore cyclist or anything, but we want you to be comfortable while you ride. Riding in shorts, riding in pants, riding in anything other than cycling gear is going to get very uncomfortable after a while um, and could make you a little sore in areas. So cycling clothing, cycling shorts. Uh, up here at the top, we've got a couple uh, here on the right hand side, right here, you'll notice this has got a chamois in it. So this is uh, some padding that goes where that's placed in actually inside and attached, sewn into the cycling shorts. So when you sit on the bike, you're not gonna be as sore. If you're just wearing regular shorts or, or tights or something like that, you're gonna get really sore after a while. These ones here on the left uh, are bib shorts. They just have kind of these suspender things. And so they go up over and either one of those are perfectly acceptable. Cycling jerseys, not absolutely necessary. You can still ride in, in like a tank top or a technical running shirt uh, or something like that. Uh, but they're also beneficial as well. Something good that is breathable. Um, and then also I will say cycling gloves, they're not, uh, they're not essential until we go outside. Um, but they are an asset for sure. So when you're riding, those hands, your palms, your hands, and your fingers can get a little sore um, from the vibrations of the bike or being placed on the, the handlebars for quite some time. So that helps with that. When we go outside, those cycling gloves are also going to help in the event that you crash, which doesn't happen a huge amount. Okay, don't I won't, don't want you to be fearful, but if you do, that's gonna that's gonna help pro, uh, protect your knuckles and your hands. In the palms of your hands. You don't want to have lots of road rash on the on the hands, okay? Don't, and you can't see it there because my face is in the way. Let's get my face out. Oh, no, I can't get my face out of the way. Don't, it says, use running shorts. That could potentially be the worst thing you could use. They're big and baggy and loose, and you're going to be sore, and you're not going to have any padding whatsoever. Okay, cycling pedals. Uh, Flats are fine, and flats are what you're going to find there at the bottom, okay, and they're going to be your most standard pedal, um, but we do encourage everyone, and this is everyone across the board, even those youngest development athletes, to learn to ride clipped in. The reason for that is that when you're riding with flats, you can only focus on one part of your pedal stroke, the front. You can really only hammer down. 
Okay, when you're clipped in, your legs and your all you can utilize that whole pedal stroke to become more efficient as you're cycling. Um, now, when it comes to racing, however, there are some rules that we need in, uh, to, to keep in mind. For those that are racing U14, so let's see, 12, 13 age group would be the oldest there. You can use clipped in shoes, but you cannot use, uh, or you, you can't use look. You need to use SPD clips. There's two different kinds of clips, SPD style and look, and I'll show you some pictures here in a moment. But the SPD clips basically recess into the shoe so that when you unclip, you can walk around on those shoes and there's no problem. Okay, the sole or the bottom, the grips of the shoes are still going to be what's touching the pavement. For 14 plus, you're able to use look style pedals um, and use triathlon shoes. Now, the, the cleat itself does not recess into the shoe in that case. So if you try to walk around on those shoes after you've unclipped, there's like this clip underneath your shoe that's going to be getting in the way. Not safe to run on. Um, and that's the primary reason why that rule is in place. Um, this right here is a look style pedal. This right here on the right hand side is an SPD pedal. And I'm going to show you a bit more of the difference here. Okay. Typically, L or sorry, look style is mostly for riding on the road or tri shoes. And that's where you've got three. I'll use a better color here. You've got, oh, no, no, no. Let's erase that. Make this a little bit easier to see. Okay, you'll see there's three holes there in a triangular pattern so that you put on this type of clip. You'll see the clip has those holes and screws in a triangular fashion. Those will go onto road bikes or triathlon specific bikes and you'll see once you put on that clip it's not recessed into the shoe there it just sits on top of the shoe versus mountain bike shoes and you don't you can still use spd clip uh, pedals and shoes on a road bike they're typically used in mountain biking but we prefer younger riders to use them um, because they're more of just a side-by-side -side pattern. So you'll see down here, it's just two screws side-by-side. -side. This is a little bit more of a simple system, but the way it works is that on these mountain biking shoes, you got this section of uh, sole of the shoe that goes down and covers up that. So you can still get off your bike and run around perfectly you know, safe, okay? So U14s look for this style, 14 plus look for this style, okay, important distinction. Let's look further at the shoes. You'll see here, this just goes to show a little bit more. This is the look style right up here in the top left. You'll notice if you were standing on top of that, <laughs> okay, the, the, the clip there, the cleat, it hangs down and it's tough to walk and especially tough to run on. These ones down here, you'll look, this person has a clip on, but you can't see it because it's up inside um, the grips of the shoe. So that one's more safe. Again, 14 plus, look at getting these types of shoes or this type of pedal and cleat system and the U14s, this one. Now, even more specifically, we're going to talk about triathlon shoes versus cycling shoes. And this is something I think that probably should be more clear at the beginning of every season, because every year we have people that go out and run out and get cycling shoes. You, even though we're on the bike, we're not strict cyclists, we're triathletes. And the difference <laughs> is that we have to swim before we bike and we got to run after we bike. And so there's the transitions there. We got to transition from one event to the other. So we want a tri shoe or a triathlon shoe. We will really do want all 14 plus athletes to be racing in triathlon shoes and not cycling shoes. So the top left here is, is, a, is a cycling or a triathlon shoe. 
you'll notice they've got a little bit of a, a loop there at the back, which makes it easier to slip into those shoes as well. You know, here on the bottom right in the cycling shoe, they've got all these um, complex clips and things to get yourself set up into the shoe. Tri shoes are very simple. This is like, it's usually one, maybe two, <laughs> Um, Velcro uh, uh, sections where it's just bang, you put it on, it's a lot more simple. Okay, this is going to make it easier to transition onto the bike and transition out of the bike. Cycling shoes, you can still sort of do it, but it's extremely difficult. So go towards the tri shoe on the top left there. Helmets, they need to be safety approved and um, preferably we would pref uh, like everyone to have a road helmet. So, you know, avoiding things like skateboard helmets, full face, <laughs> you know, BMX helmets, uh, non-cycling helmets of any kind. Okay. And personal preference, <laughs> if you have a road bike helmet with a visor, get rid of that visor. Usually the visor sits down right here. Whoops. Yeah, right there. Take the visor off. Just take it off. Um, another note about helmets is that you have to be wearing your helmet anytime you're on your bike. That is critical safety. Okay, Zwift setup. Now, this is going to be for those of you who are riding the Saturday rides. Now, youth development who were in the club last year, many of you have this equipment because we went virtual during the, during the shutdown. If that were to happen again, we would try to move to a virtual uh, setting where we would be riding on Zwift in conjunction with Zoom. Um, but for those competitive athletes who are riding on Saturdays, if you want the added benefit, the visual, of riding with the group, um, you're gonna need to get yourself set up on Zwift. Now, Zwift is an online platform that allows uh, riders to, to ride together virtually in this virtual world. Um, those riding on Saturday, you don't have to do that. You can just hop on the Zoom call at the very least and, and listen to Coach Lisa or, or myself and ride along, given the instructions, but you're certainly welcome to get set up on Zwift if you're able to. So you need a, a, either a smart trainer. So going back to when I was talking about trainers, that trainer that is also a computer, it's a compu computer inside of a trainer, that will basically replace these two items that I'm showing on the screen, which is a speed sensor, this one right here and the cadence sensor. The speed sensor goes on the rear hub of the wheel and helps um, basically tells your computer or, or your device how fast you're moving, how uh, the speed that your bike's going. Um, and then it can estimate, it estimates power from there on Zwift, which isn't necessarily super accurate. But um, and then this one on the right is the is a cadence sensor. And this is going to be um, put onto the crank arm of your pedals. And then as you pedal, it projects what your cadence is or how fast um, your feet are moving, your pedals are moving. Um, I would add here that there are speed sensors and cadence sensors that use ant plus. And there are other ones that use Bluetooth, and, and uh, a lot that have Bluetooth will use Ant Plus or Bluetooth. That is how Ant Plus and Bluetooth is how the speed sensor and the cadence sensor communicate to your computer or your, G or your device or whatever it is that you're using the data on. Um, if you've got Zwift running on your computer, it will communicate with your computer. If you are doing Zwift on your phone or an iPad, it will communicate with your iPad or your phone. Now, Ant Plus is tricky. It is okay. You can use it, but you would need an Ant Plus dongle to hook up onto your computer, and you can really only use that with your computer. 
So I would shoot for a speed sensor and cadence sensor that have Bluetooth. That is the most simple way to do it because then you don't need any additional equipment. Um, or if you have a power meter, if you're lucky enough to just have a power meter, you can use that. Um, so lastly, also the athlete would need a Zwift subscription. If you are under 16 years old, you can get a free Zwift youth account as long as you have an adult that has a Zwift account currently. Okay, and you can get unlimited youth accounts under a uh, adult Swift account, I believe. But um, there might be a there might be a limit there, um, but I'm unsure of it. Um, I have sent out the information about how to get set up on Swift. If you need that information again, if you want to get set up on Swift, let me know and I can resend you that information. I also have a link here on the presentation that kind of shows what Zwift is. And you'll see here this picture on the left. This is in the game, um, call it a game or in the software. Um, you'll notice that they're riding together as a group. It's this virtual world. You can see people from all over the world that are cycling together. Oh. Horrible line drawing there. It's got your data, so they've got their power there, their heart rate. If you've got a heart rate monitor, you can use that, their cadence, um, and then the workout here on the left. And it's fantastic, and we use it as a, as a group for those competitive athletes on, on Saturdays. Run gear. Run gear is probably the most simple of it all. Um, Really, you need running shoes, comfortable clothing, and for those competitive athletes, I would say a watch with a timer or GPS. Okay, you can get most of this stuff at a lot of different places, Mac, running room, sport check, and again, of course, on good old Amazon. Okay, number one for this is going to be running shoes. Every year we have athletes that show up in you know, tennis shoes or court shoes or just everyday shoes, you need running shoes specifically. Um, and reason for that being is that they are designed to run in. You're going to be less likely to have running injuries and, and, and get hurt. If you run with court shoes for a long time, chances are you're going to get shin splints and just be hurting after a while. So we want to make sure everyone has proper footwear. Comfortable running clothing. Okay, so don't show up in jeans or, you know, uh, pants or, or anything like that. Make sure that they're, they're comfortable. I always say cotton is rotten. So you want to go with something that's more breathable um, and wicks the moisture away. Um, and more than anything, you want something that's comfortable. Um, so shorts, technical t-shirt. Um, girls should probably uh, definitely be wearing a sports bra. Um, and uh, dress in layers for outdoors once we do go outdoors dress in layers so that if you show up and it's like oh you know what i got warmed up and now i'm i'm a lot warmer than i thought i'd be you can take off a layer and you've got a running shirt underneath okay um the watch like i said the competitive athletes and this is not mandatory but it is extremely useful you want to watch with a timer and or GPS. And I'd say that, you know, GPS is going to be important for the seniors and the elites who are doing a lot of training as well on their own in, in addition to, to running with the group. This is going to allow you, sometimes we're going to, we're going to have uh, some athletes going on a specific rest time or specific intervals. And sometimes it's tough for us to keep track of all of the groups. And so for athletes to keep track of specifically their intervals and their rest time, it's handy for them to have a, a watch. Okay, race specific finally. So tri suits or racing clothing and a race belt. And we'll go more into detail about this when we get later in the season, closer to race season in the, in the spring. If you haven't, Tri-suits, so if you haven't done 
triathlon racing before. This is basically the uniform that you wear uh, while you're racing. Now, tri suits, all draft legal athletes are going to need a tri suit. We do suggest that all athletes have a tri suit. And the benefit to that is you can wear it in the pool, uh, you can wear it on the bike, you can wear it on the run, and there's no nothing you got to throw on uh, or change in transition. So you strictly go from one discipline to the next, and you don't have to worry about anything. So you'll notice you have three athletes here in different varieties of of tri suits. But then the bottom right, right here, if you are unable to get a tri suit, this is the next best option. And this is fine for younger athletes that are not doing draft legal uh, or not competitive athletes, uh, you know, in the competitive squads or anything like that. So they would swim in their bathing suit. And as soon as they get to transition one, they've got to cover themselves by putting on a technical running shirt or cycling jersey or something like that, and then continue on with the race. And that's just fine as well. Um, the club, we will have a tri suit order, and that will uh, be coming out over the next uh, couple of months. So um, just stay tuned for that. Race belts. So many races. Um, but not all, it's not mandatory in all races. It depends on the race director and what the rules of that specific race are. But many races for youth are going to have a race bib that you need to put on for the bike and the run. And so you'll see here in the picture right here that he's got his bib attached to the belt and then the belt goes around the waist and you clip it on in, in transition, okay? Those are things you can find at running room, running stores, um, they use them in run races as well, um, but uh, if you're having trouble finding one, let me know and I can, can help you search for that. But that's something very good to have and a very important thing to put in your race bag on race day and something that we always have athletes every year that, uh, that forgot there. So make sure you grab a race belt. All right. Now, that's all I have in regards to now with equipment. It is a fair bit of information, but if you have questions, I want you to please send me an email. My email is right there um, up on this screen. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. So go back, replay this as many times as you need, ask me questions, and we'll be coming up with a couple more of these throughout the season to get some of the new athletes and those that have lots of questions specifically about triathlon ready for the season ahead.